everybody, this is yours truly, the wow <laughs> man. The second time around, and I got a story I want to tell you, but it's a little dirty, it's a little raw, and you know I don't want to, I don't want to hurt my image. <laughs> Last night, walking through the park with a flashlight in my hand, I shined my flashlight on the brother who was down on the grass with the sister, and they was making love, and the flashlight hit him, and he jumped up off the grass and slapped me. Bam! I said, man, what did you hit me for? He said, I hit you because you shined the flashlight on us, and I'm making love to my old lady out here in the park. And I said, but man, I didn't see you, and she jumped up off the grass, put her drawers back on, and slapped him. Bam! He said, baby, what you hit me for? She said, I hit you because you hit the wild man. Why did you hit the wild man. He said, I hit the wild man because he's shining that flashlight on us while I'm out here making love to you in this park. Why did you hit me? She said, I hit you, you damn fool, because the wild man did you a favor. You've been eating grass for the last two hours. <laughs> <laughs> Next door neighbor kid to me, always bugging me, always bugging me, always bugging me. And I <laughs> had a little trouble with my wife, Washer. So I went over there to this yard and said, your daddy told me that I could uh, kind of hang a clothesline from my side of the yard to your side of the yard. Do you mind? He said, yeah, go ahead on. <laughs> that had have been my daddy. Wouldn't be hanging no clothesline. I said, why? Because my daddy got two washes for my mother. I said, very good. So I guess my ladder get up on top of the, the ladder and getting ready to nail or nail in. And all of a sudden, I dropped the hammer. I come down off the ladder and reach for my hammer. Little boy looked at me and said, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> that had have been my daddy would have taken two hammers up there. Wouldn't have to come down. I said, very, very clever, very clever. Goes back up on the ladder and dropped the nail and comes back down to get a nail. He said, ha, ha, ha. If that had have been my daddy, he would have taken two nails up there. I said, all right, very good. Can I use your bathroom? He said, yeah, and we got two of them, too. And we go into the bathroom and we are, <laughs> we are peeping. And all of a sudden, he looks at him. I said, I'll get him now. I said, hey. Hey, son, I bet your daddy ain't got two of these. He said, no, but one of his will make two of yours. <laughs> I like to tell it like it is. And when you tell the truth, everything is so beautiful. And you know, this whole country is such a beautiful, truthful country. That's why I'm so glad that they didn't. Well, you know what's happening with that Coswell situation. And you know what happened, don't you? Well, I think it's a shame because I know that Coswell from Florida. I knew him when he was a judge in Florida and they found this black man in the river with 600 pounds of chains wrapped around his arm, 600 pounds of chains around his neck, 600 pounds of chains around his leg. And they pull him out of the river and the NAACP say, before you say anything, somebody from the legal department must say something on behalf of this black man with all these chains around his body, pull out of the river. And all of a sudden they got the coroner. The coroner looked at the black man with 1,200 pounds the chains on his body and said, uh-huh, 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 he's dead, all right. Then NAACP said, we're not going for that. Here's a man that was pulled out of the river with 1,200 pounds of chains around his body. Get somebody else. And they got Judge Coswell. Coswell came right out on the case, and he got up off his white horse and took off his white sheet, and he looked at this black man with 600 pounds of chains around his arm, 600 pounds of chains around his neck, 600 pounds of chains around his legs, and they pulled him out of the river one more time, and Coswell looked at him, and the NAACP said, What about this, Coswell? What about this? Coswell said, Uh-huh. 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 Mm-hmm. Just like a nigga stole more chains than he could carry. <laughs> so many people say, wow, man, I noticed one thing about Coswell, he don't smoke. Well, you wouldn't smoke either if somebody put on your cigarette packet. Smoking will make you healthy, but it will turn you blank. <laughs> Right on, ladies and gentlemen. I don't just give advice to black folks. I give advice to white folks, too. I give advice to anybody that I can help. I believe in helping my fellow man. Even gave some good advice to Governor Wallace. He was something with dandruff. Every two seconds, dandruff was falling off his hair right onto his shoulder, and he was brushing the dandruff off. And I walked up with him. I said, Governor Wallace, 
Would you like to get rid of that dandruff? He said, well, ha, 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 man, I sure would. I said, have you tried anything? He said, I've tried everything. I said, well, I'm going to show you how to get rid of that dandruff. What are you doing for it now? He said, well, every time one of them little white flakes fall off my hair onto my shoulder, I brush it away. I said, well, Governor Wallace, don't do that. Listen to the wa ha, 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 man. The next time one of them little white flakes fall off your head, Onto your shoulder. Don't you dare brush it off. Just grab one of them white flakes by your fingertips and then you paint it black. Put it back in your hair and the rest of them move out. <laughs> when you mention the fact move out, we have trouble even moving in. No joke, I moved into one of them exclusive apartments. You know, Joel, I call up for it and the man said, Yes, we have some apartment, Mr. Wildman. You know, that sounds Jewish when you're talking on the telephone. And I walked over there, and he saw me in person. He said, <laughs> I don't know how to tell you this, Mr. Wildman, but <laughs> we just rented all 99 apartments. I said, man, how you going to rent 99 apartments in five minutes? I just call you. <laughs> don't get excited, Wildman. <laughs> don't think it's a racial thing. Some of my best friends are colored. I said, man, I don't want to know nothing about your damn best friend. Do you or don't you have a place for me to stay? He said, we don't have anything right now. I'm going to sit down. Don't get excited. Sit right down there and have a piece of watermelon. I said, man, I didn't come over here eating no goddamn watermelon. I came over here looking for a place to stay. He said, well, <laughs> uh, Mr. Wildman, here's what we'll do. We'll put your name on the waiting list, and uh, as soon as the South, as soon as something becomes available, about 99 years from now, we'll call you. I said, well, if that's your policy, okay with me. As long as you treat me like you're treating everybody else. You put my name on the waiting list, he said, we sure will. Just give us your name and your telephone number, and as soon as we get something, we'll call you. So I gave my telephone number, got ready to walk out the door, reached in my coat pocket, took out a $1,000 bill and threw it in the trash can. I said, real estate man, when you get something, call me. Pardon, I wasn't home 10 minutes before the phone rang. <laughs> he said, wow, man, uh, we do have an apartment for you. Come on over and sign a lease. I went over there and signed the lease for 99 years. About four or five days later, the phone rang again. Hello, Mr. Wildman. Uh, this is your friendly real estate man. I said, well, what do you want now? He said, I don't know how to tell you this, but <laughs> you know that $1,000 bill that you threw in the trash can? I said, yeah, what about it? He said, <laughs> that money was no good. <laughs> that money was counterfeit. I said, I know it. That's why I threw in the trash can. <laughs> now, I believe there's people that would hate people no matter what color they was. I believe if there were blue people on earth, somebody would hate them, and it would probably be Negroes. I can hear them hollering and screaming right now. Them goddamn blue people that move in next door to us. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, people are moving everywhere. They're even moving back to Africa. I met some black brothers, organized, and walked up to me and said, Why? <laughs> Oh, man, you seem to be one of the brothers, and we're going back to Africa, and we're going to take you with us. I said, <laughs> I really don't want to go. He said, what do you mean you don't want to go? You originate from there. I said, I might originate from there, but I don't write nobody. He said, you're going to give us a better reason than that, that you don't want to go to Africa. I'll give you a better reason than that. I'm not going to trade my Cadillac for no elephant. Can you imagine me paying $180 a month on an elephant? And just suppose now. Just suppose I do get an elephant and decide I want to ride from one city to the next city on the interstate highway. You know what the fine is for dropping litter? $100 fine for dropping litter on this highway. Now, just suppose I'm on my elephant and he was eating eggs like thought it was candy, and I'm on him riding from one city to another city, and this elephant decided to do-do. Do you know what the fine would be for elephant shit out on the highway? <laughs> Now, I met one brother that really wanted to go to Africa. Made me felt proud. He didn't want to go there to educate nobody. He didn't want to get no gold or no diamonds. He just wanted to go to Africa to make love because he was the greatest lover in America. They called him the black loving machine. He hit the island called Africa, the love colony island. He walked up to the chief. He said, chief, I want to be the greatest lover that ever came on this love colony in Africa. The chief said, if you want to be that great, here's what you do. You come back Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, we'll have a love in. On Friday, you will make love to the most beautiful black woman on the island. And he smiled. He said, on Saturday, you're going to make love to a groovy, groovy, sexy little African queen, better known as a faggot. He said, okay, but on Sunday shall be your day of pleasure. 
Sunday you're gonna make love to a young virgin. He smiled, he said, oh, God damn, this gonna be fun. And on Friday, the tent was packed. About 500 people was there to watch this black loving machine make love to this beautiful young lady. And he got on her and he started stroking and she started whining. And he kept on stroking, stroking, stroking. And everybody knew that he was so great that when, I, when that climax hit, she faded and everybody said, oh, the great loving machine, positively the greatest. And the next night, they had a thousand people in the tent to watch this great black loving machine. And that chief looked at him and said, you know, you got a faggot here now. Do you want a little uh, Vaseline, a little Crisco or something? He said, no, 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 I don't want nothing. Just let me spit on him, bend him over, and I'll drive his ass home right now. And he got to that faggot. Ooh, my, ooh, 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 ooh. That faggot said, oh, 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 so good. Oh, 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 just, ooh, ooh, ha, ha, ha. And everybody saw how great the loving machine was. And the next night was Sunday. That was the day that he looked forward to because he knew that he was going to have that young virgin. And he walked into the tent. The tent was totally empty. Nobody there but the chief and the loving machine and the big curtain. He said, Chief, how come I ain't got no more people here? On opening night, we had 500. The next night, we had 1,000. And nobody's here but just, 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 just me and you. He said, what's going on? Where's the virgin? The chief said, you are such a valuable lover on this island that we might have to shoot this virgin when you complete your love machine on her. So to make sure that no problems come up, we didn't want nobody in the tent but just you and the virgin. And I'm even going out. He said, oh, he said, well, let me get to this virgin. Let me get to this virgin right now. He said, where's the virgin? He said, behind the curtain. And they pulled the curtain, and there was the virgin, a virgin gorilla. He said, a gorilla? A gorilla? I'm not going to stick my dingling in no damn gorilla. The chief said, go on, you're great. He said, that gorilla might crush me to death. He said, don't worry about it. We got chains on the gorilla's arm. We got chains on his legs. He's chained down. He said, well, suppose that gorilla try to fight me. He said, don't even worry about that. We got a muscle that will take 20 men to take the muscle off his mouth. He said, all right, if that's the case, I'll try it. And he jumped on that chained down gorilla, and he started stroking, and it got good to that gorilla. That gorilla said, <laughs> and the loving machine kept on stroking. All of a sudden, it got real good to that gorilla. That gorilla said, <laughs> and broke both arms loose. And the loving machine kept on stroking. It got so good to that gorilla, he kicked both legs loose and hollered. <laughs> It got so good, Tim, and the loving machine looked down, saw the gorilla's arms and legs were loose, and the gorilla wrapped his arms and legs around the loving machine, and the loving machine hollered, Help! 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 The chief ran in with a big shotgun and hollered, Shall I shoot him? Shall I shoot him? Shall I shoot him right now? The loving machine said, Hell no! Take the muzzle off! I want to kiss this mother! <laughs> so many people ask me, Steve, wow, man, what do you think of Tom Jones? And I always tell them, <laughs> if he's not a Negro, he's proven one thing, the white boy show sure got rhythm. And let me tell you a little bit about the Englishman and the soul brother. You know, the Englishman's got a beautiful gentleman approach when he's trying to make love to a young lady. Here's a typical example. The Englishman hits on a young lady. I say, will you join me to spot of tea? And the young lady says, I don't mind if we do. Soul brother. <laughs> hey, honey, let's go buy that Burger King, get some burgers and some RC and oh, happy day. <laughs> The Englishman, I say, shall we get a sparkling bottle of champagne, a burgundy bottle for two? And the young lady says, I don't mind if we do. So, brother, <laughs> let's light up one of these out of this bag, honey, and get some cold duck and ooh, <laughs> let it roll. <laughs> and then the Englishman hits him with that question. I say, Shall we retire to my boudoir? And the young lady says, I don't mind if we do. So, brother, <laughs> hey, honey, let's go by that tourist house. I know a place we can get a place for a dollar and a half an hour. We take out about two and a half hours. <laughs> and the Englishman hits him with that question. I say, shall we disrobe? And she says, I don't mind. 
if we do. Soul brother, what you mean you ain't gonna take your drawers off? Now come on, baby, I gave you two dollars and eighty cents, and you got all your clothes out the cleaners at my expense, and now you sitting up here don't want to take your drawers off. What is wrong with you, foolish woman? And the Englishman says with that beautiful romantic sound, I say, shall we have a go at it? <laughs> and she says, I don't mind if we do. And the Englishman is stroking soul fashion and the soul brother, he hits him with that question. <laughs> what you mean you ain't gonna give me none tonight? I done spent all my damn money on you and got your clothes out the cleaners. Now last week you did the same thing. I came by your house telling me I can't give you none tonight because I just put some grease on my face. The next night I came by there telling me I can't give you none tonight because I just put some mud on my face. Talking about a mud pack. Then they're talking about you, you took some castor oil and your bowels were moving. And then when you finally I thought you was, I thought everything was all right. Talking about your period is coming on. Now look, I went through all that grease stuff on your face, that mud stuff on your face, talking about your bowel movement and your period, but let me tell you something right now, mama, let me tell you something, baby, grease or mud, shit or blood, I'm gonna ride your ass tonight! And these stroking, the Englishman is stroking English fashion with short strokes. Some of you might say, why short strokes? If you ain't got nothing long, you better not take nothing but short strokes, else it might fall out on you. But all of a sudden, it gets good to the Englishman, and he says, ah, 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 I say, I do believe I'm about to arrive. And the soul brothers over there stroke in soul fashion. And this is the only time this black woman, this colored woman ever says anything. And fellas, you know I'm telling it like this. They are the only women in the world that pray when they're having sex. They pray when they're having sex. And sometimes the man that's making love to him, they'll call him the Lord if you think I'm lying. Listen to this soul brother stroke in soul fashion. And this soul sister starts praying. Oh, Lord. Oh, Jesus. Oh, God damn it. Oh Lord, oh God damn, oh Jesus, oh shit, now. oh God damn, oh God. oh shit, oh, oh Lord, oh God, oh Jesus, oh have mercy, oh God, oh Jesus, oh, oh Lord, 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 oh Lord, Lord, say something to me, and the soul brother hollers, hold on, I'm coming. feeling sad, not bad. Yes, I woke up this morning, not feeling sad, not bad. What I did to my woman, ooh, it makes me feel so glad. Yes, I kissed her soft. Yes, I kissed her, kissed her mighty low. Yes, I kissed her soft. Yes, I kissed her, I kissed her mighty low. Yes, I kissed my baby. <laughs> I kissed her. <laughs> well, I never, I, I never kissed her there before. Oh, she felt so good. She screamed, Wow, man! My man! Oh, daddy! Oh, oh, oh! Come on and do it some more. Oh, she screamed, Wow, man! My man! Oh, daddy, good God, Lord, have mercy! Come on and mm, do it some more. Yes, I did it. Yes, I did it. 
I kissed in the same place, the same place I, I, I kissed her before. Go on, play it, Benny, play it. Let me talk to my baby one time. All right, now. Sex is a trick, trick of nature, and sometimes it, it makes a man a fool. Sex is a trick of nature, and sometimes, sometimes it makes a man a fool. It takes away all of his good time energy. And then it wears out his good wailing too. Yes, I got good news for you. Wild man's gonna give you an everlasting tip. Got good news for you. Wild man's gonna give you an everlasting tip. When you get weak in the hips, When you get weak in the lips, remember to do it the wild man way. Hear what I say. Stop that wiggling and giggling. Stop that giggling and wiggling. Because someday your body's gonna be too tired. We're so tired. So, so tired, too tired for wiggling. Yes, your head's gonna be so tired. Your mouth's gonna be too tired. Your mouth's gonna be too tired for giggling. So take a tip. No matter if you travel, Near Rafa Take this tip No matter if you travel Near Rafa When you get to Oh the cut the mustard Remember You can still lick the jar. <laughs> Got good news for everybody out there. Wow, <laughs> man, lad. Oh, this is good news for the Italian, the Negro, and the Jew. You know what's going to happen, friends? Oh, they're going to start picking the President of the United States of America. Anybody that's qualified to go to Washington will be picked by a computer. And they tried this computer out on three great men, an Italian, a Negro, and a Jew. And the first one to qualify his qualification in through the computer was an Italian fellow. He walked up to the computer and said, I'm Italian, 37 years of age, former member of the Mafia, excommunicated from the church, divorced, working currently as a taxi cab driver, and the only thing that kept me out of high school was grammar school. I have no political experience whatsoever, but I'm Catholic, and I do believe that there's a place in the White House for an Italian like me. Computer, is there a place for a man of my qualification, an Italian, uh, with no political experience whatsoever, is there a place in the White House for me? And the computer went as follow. Message, report to the Senate on Monday. Starting salary, $37,000 per year. Next candidate, please. Jewish fella. I'm Jewish, 40 years of age, majored in business administration, had several businesses in various places in the country. Currently, we have one small business in Washington, D.C. We do not have any political experience whatsoever, but we have a lot of experience in uh, businesses of all sorts. And we believe that uh, we are family people and we believe sincerely that we can be an asset to the United States of America. Computer is their place in the White House for me. And the computer went as follow. Rrrr, message, report to Congress on Tuesday. Starting salary, $57,000 per year. Next candidate, please. 
Soul brother, black man, walks up to the computer. I'm a Negro, 47 years of age, graduated from high school, graduated from college, majored in political science, was on the advisory board under the uh, last President Johnson, I also was on the advisory committee on world affairs for the United Nations, currently uh, working as a secretary to the foreign affairs and also to the economic problems that we have in the urban renewal program under uh, President Nixon. And we have about 22 years of a uh, political background and we're actively in politics now. We have a son over there in Vietnam. We also have one in West Point. We, are, we have it approximately, I'd say, about 25 or 26 years in the political field. And we graduated, like we said, from Yale University, and we majored in political science. Is there a place in the White House for a black man with my political background and my political experience? And the computer went as follows. your big black ass in Mississippi Monday morning ready to pick cotton. <laughs> Even though we have problems like that, I don't demonstrate. I don't demonstrate. I donate my money and try to help the cause and try to make equality uh, really a reality in this wonderful place that we call America. See, the reason why I don't demonstrate, I know when they was having all that demonstration about two or three summers ago, I don't know. I came home one day and my little boy had painted himself white all over. He was white all over, white paint all over his arm, all over his face. And I walked in and looked at him painted white. I said, son, why did you paint yourself white? He said, daddy, I'm demonstrating brotherly love. Everybody in this house is black with the afro. So I figured that if I painted myself white and we got along beautiful, that it would be a beautiful way of demonstrating peace. I thought that was so clever. Until I looked at him painted white and saw that white paint all over that wall-to-wall -wall carpet, all over the, my white bed spread. I got so mad at him, I grabbed him, I whipped him all on his left side of his butt. His mother came home and saw that white paint all over wall-to-wall -wall drapes, all over the kitchen, white paint everywhere. She got so mad, she whipped him on the other side of his butt. He went upstairs painted white, crying. <laughs> his grandfather said, what is wrong, son? He said, I ain't been white. 10 minutes and already hate two colored people. <laughs> but I dig my wife, though. She's such a wonderful person, although she's been worrying me lately. The other night, she went out and came home with a mink coat. I said, hey, baby, where'd you get that mink coat from? She said, oh, wow. <laughs> oh, man, don't get excited. I had the lucky ticket and I won it out of raffle. I said, good. And the next night, she went out, came back home with a diamond bracelet. I said, where'd you get that from? She said, wow, <laughs> man, don't get excited. I have the lucky ticket and I won it out of raffle. I said, okay. The next night, she came home with about $50 in a pocketbook. I said, where'd you get all that money from? She said, wow, <laughs> man, don't get excited. I have the lucky ticket and I won it out of raffle. I said, okay. The next night, she got ready to go out. She said, I'm going to a raffle tonight, dear. Would you run my bath water? I said, sure. And I went in the bathtub and got got myself a teaspoon, put a teaspoon of hot water in the bathtub, a teaspoon of cold water in the bathtub. I said, hey, baby, come on and take your bath and go to the raffle. And she walked into the bathroom and looked in the bathtub and said, how am I going to take a bath and that little bit of water? I said, honey, I didn't want you to get your raffle ticket wet. <laughs> and even though she got her raffle ticket wet, it would be smelling nice. <laughs> you know why? Because my darling is using a new dish powder. And girls out there in Wild Man Land, I want you to try this dish powder. Don't you dare walk into the drugstore tomorrow or the next day after listening to the Wild Man. Don't you walk into the drugstore and say, I want some dish powder. You walk into the drugstore and you ask the man to give you some alum honey dish powder. Remember the name, alum honey dish powder. And some of you might say, why should I use alum honey dish powder? I'll tell you why, because the alum will make it tighter for the pizza, and the honey will make it sweeter for the eater. <laughs> yeah, every once in a while, everybody gets a little high. I know that fella right there listening. <laughs> Listen to the wild man right now. He, <laughs> but he don't drink no more. A lot of y'all say, how come my man 
man don't drink no more. I'll tell you why. He was hanging out with us one night and he got drunk and started chasing women like he usually do. So we said, hey man, we got you fixed up with a young lady in room 217. All you gotta do is go up there. He went all over the hotel. He couldn't find no room 217. He was so drunk. So he just put it, just opened the door to 271 and went on in, took off all his clothes and got in bed. He didn't know that in the bed was a fella from Vietnam, a big Texan, and he laid in the bed naked and went to sleep. The next morning he woke up and looked at that big Texan laying in the bed. He said, my God, I must have been tight last night. The Texan said, you were the first time or the second time. Oh, happy day. <laughs> stop drinking and I always have a remedy that's right the wild man always like to give out good advice if you want to stop drinking do like I tell my good friends all the time a buddy of mine that was old lady was gonna quit him she told him said if you come home drunk one more time if you hit that door drunk one more time I'm gonna quit you he said honey I couldn't live without you please darling I'll never drink no more and he ran into the wild man with a pocket full of money we got out got ourselves about two or three bottles of scotch partner and we were feeling good 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 and he looked at me and said Steve I'm drunk and my old lady told me if I come home drunk again she was gonna quit me I said man don't worry about a thing you with the wild man I take care of plenty of business I went into the kitchen and remember this fellas I went into the kitchen I got five cans of Maine sardines Remember the name, Maine Sardines. Oh, all five cans. Took the sardines out of the can and threw them in the trash can. And I took that sardine juice and I rubbed that sardine juice all over his eyes, all over his forehead, all over his cheeks, and all over his lips. Remember, you must rub that sardine juice all over the lips because the lips are the most fascinating part of the body. Believe me when I tell you, an old man told me this long time ago, son, when you get weak in the hips, you get strong in the lips. And I rubbed this sardine juice all over his lip. I said, now, now drink a little bit of it. And he drank a little bit. I said, bro, your breath into my face. He said, ah. I said, you're all right, man. Go on home. He said, Steve, but I'm still drunk. I said, don't worry about it. He staggered home. His old lady peeped out the window and he knocked on the door. And she said, I see you. You're drunk again. He said, honey, honey, I ain't drunk. Baby, if you think I'm drunk, smell my breath. And he blew his breath in her face. She said, damn it. No sooner I break out of one habit, you pick up a nun. <laughs> I love talking about the three most important people in America, and you know who I'm talking about. I'm talking about the Italian, the Negro, and the Jew. The Italian, the Negro, and the Jew. Oh, man, I, do. I even love hanging out with the Jewish fellas. I do anything with a Jewish fella except one thing, that is play golf with them. I will not play golf with Steve Blaine or nobody else. I'll tell you why. We out on the golf course, everybody's hollering, four, four. Steve Blaine is hollering, 399, 399. <laughs> Yes, again, we're going to talk about the three most important people in America, the Italian, the Negro, and the Jew. And they are out there on submarine duty. And when I say on submarine duty, they're in enemy territory. The Italian, the Negro, and the Jew, each one of them have a duty on this submarine ship. And let me tell you the duty of the Italian fella. He's a commanding officer. All orders must come from the Italian commanding officer. And the soul brother, the colored brother, he's known as Smiling Tar Peter Dick. He is known as Smiling Tom Peter Dick. In the entire scene, he don't say anything. He don't say not one word because he's a brave black man waiting for orders from the commanding officer or the Jewish captain. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the captain. The captain is a faggot. I mean, what the heck? You got faggots in the Army, in the Navy. How can you have a faggot in the submarine? After all, a faggot will go down on anything, so why not let him go down on a submarine? So they're in enemy territory, and the Italian commanding officer hollers, Captain! Captain! Enemy ship sighted 5,000 yards away! What must I do? The Jewish captain says, do not fire. Get a little bit closer. Remember, these torpedoes cost $45,000 apiece. The Italian commanding officer hollers, Captain! Captain! Enemy ship only 3,000 yards away! What must I do? The Jewish captain says, do not fire. Get a little bit closer. Remember, these torpedoes cost $45,000 apiece. The Italian commanding officer, Captain! Captain, we're only 2,000 yards away. I believe they have torpedoes aboard their ship. What must I do? The 
Jewish captain says, do not fire. Get a little bit closer. Remember, these torpedoes cost $45,000 apiece. The Italian commanding officer, Captain, Captain, we're only 500 yards away. Captain, they got torpedoes aboard that ship. Captain, they got torpedoes aboard that ship. What must I do? The Jewish captain says, do not fire. Get a little bit closer. Remember, these torpedoes cost $45,000 apiece. The Italian commanding officer, Captain, Captain, oh my God, Captain, they got torpedoes aboard their ship. Captain, Captain, they're getting rid of the fire on us. Captain, 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 what must I do? The color fella say, fire that mother, I pay for it myself. <laughs> into a restaurant the other day and I said, oh, I'd like to have some uh, scrambled eggs. And the lady said, all right. And <laughs> in about five seconds, she brought me some scrambled eggs and I looked at them and smelled them. I said, hey, honey, wait a minute, baby. Come here, come here, waitress. These eggs are not fresh. She said, what do you mean they're not fresh? We have a little barnyard in the back of this restaurant and we go out there and we get our eggs as no sooner they hand lay them. I said, well, I'm not trying to complain, miss, but these eggs has a little odor to them. They can't be fresh. I, I believe you have a little barnyard. We do. We have hens in the back of the restaurant. I said, well, just answer me one question if you don't mind. Do you have a rooster in the back of the barnyard? She said, no, we don't have no rooster. I said, you better get one because a skunk is screwing your chickens. <laughs> yes, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to thank you. I'd like to thank you for that first album because we sold close to a million copies. And ladies and gentlemen, when we got the report from the trade magazines, it made me feel so happy that I, that I know that I've invaded so many homes and brought a little taste of happiness to each and every one of you. And ladies and gentlemen, this happiness really caused me to get arrested. I got arrested, that's right. I got the report back how many millions of albums that we've sold. And I went home and my old lady said to me, she said, wow, man, How's the album doing? And I looked at it, I said, what? How is the album doing? How is the album doing? And I lift up my old lady and threw her out the window and went before the judge. The judge said to me, wow, man, Steve, you're accused of throwing your old lady out the window. How do you plead? I said, your honor, I plead guilty with an explanation. He said, we'll accept your uh, guilty plea, but what is your explanation? I said, Your Honor, I got the report back from the office that my album was selling a million copies. I was so excited that when I went home and, 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 and my old lady asked me, how was the album doing? And I just threw out the window. The judge said, well, what has that got to do? Cause you're selling a lot of albums. What has that got to do with throwing your old lady out the window? I said, Your Honor, when I found out that I had sold a million albums, I felt so good, I just wanted to pitch a bitch. Ha <laughs>